Welcome to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. This teaching is from the series, What is the Church? Many think of the church as a building or organization, but scripture teaches something far different. The church is the community of God's people who gather for worship, love, and care for one another and serve God's purposes in the world. We hope this helps you understand and apply God's word in your life today. I also want to say hi this morning. We have a few visitors that are here with us. We appreciate folks jumping in and uh, worshiping with us. Um, For those who are visitors in the booklet, it'll have today's teaching text, which is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And it'll also have a um, kind of a summary statement of the teaching And we have a catechism here at our church to try and summarize some of the most important things about the faith. And that will be in there as well. Can you hear me back there? Okay. I will. I I can project with my voice. That won't be a problem. It's just going to be a matter of uh, making sure it's loud enough as it's being recorded. So am I coming through okay now? Everybody can hear me okay in the back. Okay, so uh, you can look in the booklet and it'll also have the catechism question that we are covering each week right now. So today we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Uh, And actually today I'm going to be using the 2011 version of the NIV. I normally use the 1984, but uh, for some reasons I'll mention in a few minutes, this translation is actually better in a very important way uh, fr- from the Greek, and I'll explain that in a couple minutes. So, let's uh, hear God's word together. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. A few years ago, uh, Linda and I, when we were on our 30th anniversary, we got to spend 15 glorious days in Italy. Uh, There is a lot to appreciate about Italy, the food, the slow pace of life. It's just beautiful country. Uh, But one of the other things that was really amazing to see was some of the ancient history buildings, things from the Roman Empire a couple thousand years ago, and then the many, many incredible church buildings throughout Italy. There are so many beautiful cathedrals there that when you stop and look and think that these things were built, some of them a thousand years ago, uh, you know, some of them up to two thousand years ago, uh, just incredibly beautiful buildings. And of course, that did not begin with Christianity. Uh, Before Christianity, there were other religions. In fact, some of the beautiful buildings where Christians worship over there now, like the Pantheon in Rome itself, was actually built by pagans. They tended to build beautiful temples to their false gods. Uh, But in the Old Testament, Solomon built an incredible temple in Jerusalem that later got destroyed, and then Herod rebuilt an even bigger, more glorious temple in Jerusalem. And so all of these are examples of ways that people build buildings that they declare are temples or the houses of their God. But we're trying to ask ourselves for a a number of weeks here, what is the church? And in our catechism in question 70, the actual question is, what is the church? And we say that the church is the body, bride, and temple of Christ, the community of all true believers for all time. So we're in the third week right now. We're looking at this idea of the church as the temple. But that should bring up a question. If the church is the temple, what does that mean about all these other buildings? Are are they really temples as well? And what about us as individual believers? Where is the temple of God in the earth today. If you want to know where God is, where do you go? Where do you look? Well, that's what Paul's teaching in this text. So in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, notice he says that 
you yourselves are God's temple. And in verse 17, he says, God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Now, very often when this set of verses is quoted, it's been used by Christians to say that I individually am the temple. My body is sacred. And if if something happens to my body, if I'm not taking care of my body, then I'm destroying God's temple. And that's actually not what this verse is teaching. That is a true statement. Paul actually mentions later in this same letter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, Paul says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? And he goes on and says, You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So that is a true teaching. We really... My body individually, the Holy Spirit, does dwell in me. But that is not what 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is about. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is about the church. And so here we want to focus today on the fact that the church, we corporately are the body of Christ. Now why I say it is the church is notice that he says, you yourselves. One of the reasons I went to the 2011 NIV, we have a problem in English. When I use the word you, you can mean you individually or you plurally. Most languages don't have that problem. And in fact, Greek does not have that problem. It's very clear whether you mean you or y'all, okay? And this verse speaking in my good southern with which I grew up in Georgia, says, don't you know that y'all are God's temple? Don't you know that God's temple is sacred and y'all together are that temple? That's Paul's point here. The whole focus in this passage is on the corporate church as God's true temple in the earth today. So, Notice the reason that Paul tells us this is the case is because God's spirit dwells in the church. This is where God lives and dwells. Notice in 1 Corinthians 3, 17 again, it says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? That's actually verse 16. So the presence of the spirit is what makes the temple of God. I love seeing those beautiful buildings in Italy. I would love to go to Jerusalem and see the Wailing Wall. But being a big, impressive piece of architecture does not make something the temple. Being a place even where Christians gather in a somewhat less impressive piece of architecture does not make it the temple. What determines if it's the temple is Does God's spirit dwell there? Where does God dwell by his Holy Spirit? And Paul says, the spirit dwells in you as the church. That's why you are now the temple. Wherever God's spirit dwells is the temple. And so, and notice there, the the NIV has actually translated it, that the Uh, God's spirit dwells in your midst, which is really what the Greek is trying to drive at in this verse, is to say, not just that the spirit dwells in me individually, that's true, but in a very special way, when you and I come together, when we gather on Sunday morning and do what we are doing right now, God's spirit dwells in our midst in a special way that does not happen when I am home alone. Now, we've oftentimes lost this in the evangelical church. We're kind of what we refer to as low church. We don't make much of the institutional church and uh, and its practices, but Paul does make much of them because God, by his spirit, does make much of them. And so the message is, don't y'all know, when y'all gather together, the spirit is dwelling in in the midst of you all. That's where the Spirit particularly lives. What the Puritans used to refer to as the manifest presence of God. Now the fact is, 
is there anywhere where God is not? No. God exists everywhere. I mean, if we got in a spaceship and went to the farthest corners of the universe, God is there. Wherever we are, David says in Psalm 139, I go up to heaven, you're there. I even go down to Sheol, you're down there. Everywhere I might go, you were with me when I was still in my mother's womb. You were knitting me together. You'll be with me throughout my life. You're with me even in death. Everywhere you go, God is. But just because God is there in one sense does not mean that his spirit is dwelling there in his manifest presence where he is there in presence and blessing and power. And Paul says, where that is, is where you all are gathered together. That's what it is. Now, this is not the only place where this is taught. Paul also mentions the same thing in his second letter to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. And he says this, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Paul's quoting there from the book of Leviticus where God had said, look, I'm putting the tabernacle in your midst and that means I'm going to be dwelling among all of you. Where Israel is gathered, I'm there in the midst and that's my temple, that's my place of dwelling and presence. But Paul says today that that's not what's going on in Jerusalem, that's the church. That is the temple of God. And it is God being in the midst of us. And notice again, we mention this all the time, the covenant motto, I will be your God and you will be my people. And Paul says what that means is, is that's where the Spirit dwells. That's where God walks, and he lives among the people of God. Paul teaches the same thing in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. He's speaking of Jesus, and he says, In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Notice once again, the church is the temple. God dwells there by his spirit. And the whole church is God's building. The whole church is God's temple. But notice as well, that's true of the, if I can use the phrase, capital C church. But it's also true, Paul says, in him you two are being built together. That's present. That's an ongoing activity. That's not just that while it is true, we and the church in Indonesia are together one church and we are together God's temple. It's also true God is building this local congregation to be part of that temple. And so notice Paul says you are being built together. That's something that implies more than just we're a random assemblage of individuals who happen to co-locate one time a week. That's not Paul's point. He says you're being built together. And as you are built together, God's spirit dwells there in your midst. You are the temple of God. So what are the implications? What does this mean for us as Christians today? First thing is to understand the church is the only temple of God in the new covenant. We are not a temple. We are the temple of God. The temple is the place where God's spirit dwells. Again, his presence is everywhere, but his manifest presence is not everywhere. His manifest presence is found in his temple, the church. This was true in the Old Testament. Israel wasn't allowed to have many, many temples. There was one temple temple. And in fact, if you built other places, they were called high places, and God said they're an abomination, they have to be destroyed. There's one temple. That's all. There's one God. He has one temple in the earth. That's always true. And that's why Paul can quote in 2 Corinthians and say, hey, don't you understand when the tabernacle was dwelling in the midst of God's people, it was the one place of God's dwelling. It was there in the midst. And the same thing is true today. But interestingly, it's not the temple in Jerusalem. It's the church. And in Corinth, it's a bunch of former pagans 
who are now gathered together, and they are the temple of God. And it's, it's really important, and I'm not going to talk much about this today. You can listen. I've already recorded after hours. You can listen to it on Tuesday. But this is an important new covenant principle. God does not dwell in buildings made with hands. It's great to have them. Uh, in a couple of months when it gets cold, we're going to be glad to not have to sit out in a field. Okay, yes. <laughs> Some of us won't be able to gather then, and we'll wish we could still meet outside. But buildings are wonderful. They can be beautiful. It's, I loved in Italy. It was impressive to go in and see them. But God's spirit in the new covenant does not dwell in a building. No matter what the building is, no matter who built it, no matter what purpose they have for it, God dwells in people in the new covenant. You can listen more about that on Tuesday, but it's important for us to understand. If you're looking for the temple of God, you find it in the people of God and nowhere else. Secondly, the church, if it's the temple, is the house of worship. Now, this is implicit because that's what always went on at the temple. God's people worship God there. God met with his people at the temple. In 1 Peter chapter 2, I didn't know that Scott was going to go over this this morning to begin our meeting, but that's exactly what Peter wrote to uh, the believers. He said, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So notice he's using this language of a spiritual house, but it's a house that has a priesthood and offers sacrifices. What house is that in the Old Covenant? It's the temple. And in fact, you don't even have to be part of the Old Covenant. The, the Gentile believers, which is mainly what Peter was writing to, those believers had all kinds of pagan temples around. They knew which house had priests and offered sacrifices. But Peter says that's no longer a physical building. That is now the people of God. You are being built together into a house where God is worshipped. But see, the interesting thing is, how many of us today, we all brought chairs or blankets, you tried to dress appropriately, who here brought a little lamb to slaughter and sacrifice? Amazingly, none of us, right? Well, why not? In the Old Covenant, the very first thing you had to do when you came in was bring an animal to sacrifice. Why don't we do that anymore? Because Jesus is our sacrifice. We don't. If I do the same thing they did in the Old Covenant, it wouldn't be blessed by God. It would actually be an abomination to God because it would be saying that, well, Jesus wasn't really the fulfillment. So because Jesus has offered himself once and for all, our sacrifices, our worship is no longer sacrificing little animals. It's rather that we offer praise to God with our lips. Peter says this in chapter 2, verse 9. He says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We don't sing when we gather because we just all fancy ourselves to be folk singers or rock stars. It's not why we do it. We do it because we are gathering and saying, God, you are awesome. You are worthy to be praised. I worship you by declaring the fact I was dead. I'm now alive. I was lost. I've been found. I was blind. Now I see. And all of it's because of your work, not my work. And so as priests in the temple, notice Peter here says twice, we're a holy priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. Who here is a priest of God. If you're a priest, raise your hand. If your hand's not up, then you're proclaiming you're not a believer. Because if you are a believer, you are a priest. And what we do is offer sacrifices to God, but they're the, the sacrifice of our words and our lives. The same thing is spoken in the book of Hebrews by a, a different author. 
In Hebrews 13, 15, we read, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. So make no mistake, when we gather on Sunday, you are as much the temple of God as what was happening in Jerusalem. In fact, you are more the temple of God. That was a type and a shadow. You are the real temple of God. When we gather together, you are not kind of like priests. You are the holy, royal priesthood. And when we sing praises to God, when we pray and offer thanks to God, when we open God's word, when we come to the table, we're not doing things that are like sacrifices and worship. We are doing the actual worship to which that in the old covenant was just a type, a shadow, a pointer. And, and I would remind you, I'm not going to dwell on this today, but you remember when Jesus went in and he cleansed the temple. What, what did he say that the temple was supposed to be? They had turned it into a den of thieves, but what was the temple supposed to be? A house of prayer for all nations. So when we gather together, it, it's serious business. I, I encourage you, I challenge you each week when somebody starts the meeting in prayer, when very often it's Greg finishes our singing in prayer. Our singing is actually corporate prayer being offered in a musical form. When we pray for our missionaries, it is not the time for me to let my mind wander to do other things, to grade the prayer that went on. It is time for us to be part of the house of prayer, to gather together, to join together. Do we believe God is in our midst, manifest presence, the temple is gathered. I am here. It is the house of prayer, and it's a house of prayer for all nations. Whatever tribe, whatever language, whatever tongue you come from, you are invited to pray. And we are praying for all nations. Friends, do we believe that? Because that's what it means for the church to be the temple. And we're going to look more a little bit later in the series at the church as the house of worship. The next thing that Paul wants us to understand when he says that the church is the temple is that there is to be one unified temple. I've been kind of on a theme here over the last couple of months, looking at the church as the image of the Trinity and, and speaking of this importance of unity. But notice Paul's language in verse 17. I, I hope we pay attention to these things because this should put the fear of God in us. Paul says... If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Now again, the temple's only sacred. The word is actually holy. I'll come back to that in a moment. Because God dwells in its midst. That's what makes a place holy. Nothing else does. And to destroy the temple is to incur God's judgment for destroying his house. I mean, those are very strong words that Paul uses. But here's the question. I can understand if that building were the temple, how would I destroy it? I bring in a bulldozer, I knock it over. How do, if this is the temple, how do I destroy it? I mean, you can't bring a bulldozer in. I assume we would all get up and move around, right? And not, not let it run over us. What's Paul talking about? If you read 1 Corinthians 3 and 4, and actually from chapter 1 and 2, his primary concern is there are people who are disrupting the unity of the church. And Paul gives one of the strongest warnings that he ever gives and says, you need to understand, if you want to destroy the unity of the church, you are doing nothing less than destroying God's temple, and you better watch out. God takes that very seriously. And so the particular destruction in 1 Corinthians is foremostly disunity. It dominates much of the letter. Read 1 Corinthians and you'll see over and over and over again, Paul's concern is that there is disunity. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Peter. And Paul says, none of them were sacrificed for you. None of them died for you. You weren't baptized in any of their names. It's Jesus Christ who saved you. It's Jesus who brings you here. There is one church. 
But the other way that I can destroy the, the unity of the church is simply not being built together in the church. Because if the church is going to be one temple, it has to actually be built together. The picture is not that we're a group of stones thrown about in a field. That's not a house. That's not a temple. That's a group of stones thrown about randomly in a field. So notice again, Paul says, you together are that temple. And in Ephesians chapter 2 again, I bring up the, the verse I mentioned a few minutes ago where he says, in him, in Jesus, you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is an ongoing work. And it will be a work in your life and in mine by the spirit of God until you draw your last breath and until I draw my last breath. We are either building into God's temple or I'm destroying God's temple. There really is no in-between. There is no for a believer, well, I just, you know, the church does its thing, I do my thing over here. That's not a potential according to the New Testament. I'm either being built in to the temple or I'm actually undoing it. So to walk in isolation from other believers and the church prevents the church from being built together as he commands and reduces the worship that God is due. We are the church because each of us, remember Paul's other metaphors, we're the body. If I'm not building in, then the church is missing its hand, or in my case, more likely its mouth. Um, right? Uh, for other people, you're, it's a different gift you're bringing, but we are lacking. When God has called someone to be part of a church and we're not there, we are actually stealing from the temple. We are stealing from the body because we are not bringing our gifts. We gather together to worship God together. And if I'm not here being part of the worship, I'm actually reducing the worship that goes to God when we are to be gathered together. So it is a serious, serious thing for us. Number one, to definitely not undermine the act of unity of the church. Please make it a constant prayer and make it a thing. I'm again, I love our local congregation. I'm excited about what God does here in our local congregation. There are many wonderful local congregations in Annapolis. I am glad to be friends with believers in other local congregations in Annapolis. I pray for them. I pray for God to prosper their work. We are not in competition. We're not one temple, and they're a different temple. We are part of one's, God's one true temple as it exists here in our area. Then that leads to the last area, and we'll do applying the word. And that is the church is to be a holy temple. You may hear some of these phrases are recurring each week as we've talked about them because all these metaphors are pointing back to the reality of who the church is. And so Paul says, again, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred. The, the word in Greek is hagios. It's literally holy. It's the same word we use for saints. I understand why we do it, and I'll even refer to St. Augustine, but I'll ask again, how many people here are saints? Okay, if you're not, you're not a believer. All believers are saints, but the word saint literally just means holy one one who's been called out by God, one who is separated and sanctified by the Spirit of God. And so Paul says the church is holy. The temple is holy because God who dwells in it is holy, and each of you are literally holy ones. That's how Paul began the letter to the Corinthians. I'm writing to all of you who are called to be saints. You can look at 1 Corinthians 1, 1 and 2. You are called to be saints. You are called to be holy ones. But the problem is that's what the Corinthians were called to be. But if you've ever read the letter of 1 Corinthians, there are all kinds of problems. They are in disunity with one another. They're speaking evil of one another. There is there is sexual immorality so bad, Paul says, you're even making the pagans blush by your behavior. You are worse 
than the culture around you, which is bad enough, but you're even being worse. You are taking each other to lawsuits. One of you thinks you can just, you know, uh, there, there are people who are just running off and divorcing willy-nilly. There are people who are not building into their marriage. He says, some of you think, I just run down to the temple and eat whatever meat is offered there, and it doesn't matter whether my brother or sister thinks that that's okay or not. I, I, Paul says, you're actually destroying your brother and sister just so you can have, in our parlance, a Big Mac. Skip the meal. It's not that important. Over and over again, Paul says, actually, when they came to the Lord's table, which we're going to do in a few minutes, he said, it's not even the Lord's Supper, because you're all disunified. Some of you are actually getting drunk at the Lord's table. That's not the cup of the Lord. You're just down in a bunch of wine. Paul, over and over again, is making an appeal saying, you are to be holy. He makes the same point again in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the verse that I read a few minutes ago. He goes on. So listen to 2 Corinthians 6, 16 through chapter 7, verse 1, which is really all one unit. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord." Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Paul says, you're the temple. God dwells in your midst. God is holy. But God therefore says, you're not like a pagan idol temple. They can do whatever they want because their gods are not holy. But your God is holy. Therefore, come out from them. Be separate. So I repeat this regularly, but we need to hear it regularly. Are we going to be able to walk the way that the world around us walks? I want to hear y'all. Can, can we live the way they live? We cannot. Okay? Their morality shifts and changes like the wind blows through here. It just comes and it goes. It's one thing today and it'll be a different thing tomorrow. The very people that are held up as paragons of virtue today, a year from now, people are going to be wanting to tear down whatever statue they built of them because that shifts and changes. God's law does not change. What was wrong 2,000 years ago is wrong today. And it will be 2,000 years from now should Jesus tarry. And so we do not take our standard from the culture around us. We take it from God's holy word and from the Holy Spirit who's in our midst. Paul says this over and over again. Don't you sense what the Spirit is telling you? you got to stay in step with the Spirit. The Spirit's not leading you to idolatry and witchcraft and adultery and fornication and homosexuality and greed and thievery and stealing and lying and gossip. That's not the way the Spirit of God is leading you. The Spirit's leading you to love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what the Spirit's working in your midst. So the place, to be the place where the manifest presence of God dwells by the Spirit, the church must be holy. Fully embracing God and his ways, no matter what the shifting opinions of our culture are. I said a, a week or two ago, I'm not a prophet, but I strongly suspect the church in America has dark days ahead, okay? O over the coming number of years, things we believe and that are mandatory for us, they're not optional, some of them are going to be outlawed. It's, you're not going to be able to speak these things, say them, and do them in public, to which our response has to be, I will not change. My opinion doesn't shift. I stand by what God says. Okay, I will not burn a pinch of incense to Caesar. No matter. I pray for Caesar. 
I will be respectful to Caesar. I will have a submissive attitude even while Caesar beats me or imprisons me, but I will not obey. I will obey God rather than man. So do we understand this? And what that means for you and me personally is we have to be walking in holiness, individually walking the way that God calls. Now, so we're going to do applying the word today, and I have two basic brief questions. The first question is, do I see that the church is God's temple? Do I see and understand that? Th this is a, a key point that we're trying to do. As, as I was praying and seeking God about what we were going to do when we started meeting outside, I wanted to go through and say part of it is, yes, we're meeting here, but we're not suddenly close to being the church that, that's not the church. That's the building where the church gathers. This is the church. And we could be meeting here. We could be meeting on a cruise ship if we were crazy and went on a cruise ship today while coronavirus is going around. Doesn't matter where we are. We are the church. God does not dwell in buildings. Please, I love beautiful buildings. There's they're something that, I mean... Man, I, I kept laughing when we were in Italy and saying, I think this is part of God's sense of humor is I love these glorious cathedrals and, and where I serve, we meet in a big metal warehouse. That's just part of, I think, God's humor on the whole deal. I would love to preach in somewhere like the cathedral in Siena or in Florence, but the fact is it doesn't make any difference. What makes the temple is where the spirit is, where God is. And he is in the midst of his church. And so it's been important this year. 2020 is a year where this whole idea is being driven home. How much has the church been shut down? How much has Bay Ridge been shut down this year? A answer is none. When we could not meet, when we were basically not allowed out of our homes, the church still existed. And we were called to still be on mission. We may have to, you know, regroup, reorient, and head off in a different direction, but that's okay. That's what we are called to do. The church is the people of God. We are where God dwells. And it's important for us to gather. And, and one of the things that I hope God drives home while we're out here doing this, while we're meeting outside, is when we gather, God fills the midst of our meeting. He's got a very big space to fill right now, but he fills it when we gather together. We are God's church. And what that means for you and me, if you understand that and if I understand it, we are compelled to gather. The church gathers. I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago. We need to ask ourselves, in China right now, the church is under real persecution. We are not. They are. Why do they still gather? We've prayed. Many of you have seen the pictures that we can't even put up on the internet of the underground church planning movement that we're supporting and working with in Iran. Why on earth in Iran would you gather? It's so dangerous. Why do it? Because if you're the church, you gather. That's what you do. But I fear the church in America, we gather if it's convenient. But that's not what the church does. The church gathers, convenient or not. And we have to seek God and do that. So if it is at all possible, we gather. That's why I, I encourage you, everyone that's here today, and even if you're listening, we have a brief period of time where we can meet. There are people, I mean, my own wife, Linda, can't meet when we meet inside. We've got other folks that are cancer survivors or by age, they cannot meet. So we need to take advantage of every opportunity we have to gather, to be together, because as a shepherd, I'm telling you, Come November and December, there are going to be many of us saying, I would give anything to be able to gather. Well, now's the time. Let's do it together. And then when we do move back indoors, if at all possible, gather. 
Second question, do I expect the powerful presence of God's Spirit when we gather? Do I expect the powerful presence of God's Spirit when we gather? We are not a social club having a meeting. We are the temple of God. When we gather as God's temple for worship, we should expect for God to be here and to meet us powerfully, to work in us, so that when I get back in my car, I am not the same as when I drove here and got out of my car. That should be my expectation each and every time I gather. Now, now let me ask a couple of questions to tease that out. Do I expect the powerful presence of God's Spirit when we gather? Well, here's how I can answer that. Do I come prepared to worship? Now, what I mean by that, for example, I learned years ago, this was actually, it, it's silly, because I had learned it when I was a mid, and then I had to relearn it even when I was a pastor. If I stay up until 2 o'clock on Sunday morning because I'm just watching reruns of something on TV, the answer to that question is I'm not coming prepared to worship. I'm coming prepared to sleep. I'm worn down. Do I treat the gathering of God's people as Sabbath? It does not, in the new covenant, the Sabbath does not necessarily happen on one day a week. But there is this principle that it needs to drive things and it needs to be different. Uh, when our kids were young, it started at about 6.30 or 7 on Saturday night. It included we did not do events on Sunday, period. We just didn't do them. That's when God's people gathered. And in fact, we weren't running around late on Saturday night because we were getting ready to gather with God's people. I wanted to bring my best game, so to speak. I wanted to be ready when we gathered as God's people. Do I come ready to do that? Do I get here early? Okay, because when is worship when we gather? When is it? Is it just one part of the meeting or is it the entire gathering? It's the entire gathering from the first second when Scott said, hey, everybody, welcome here. And actually even literally before because we were fellowshipping with one another until the, the last note of the benediction rings out. That is all worship. And if we understand that God is here meeting with us, I want to suck out every bit of that I can. I don't want to miss any of that. Do I get here not at 10.05? Do I get here early to join in and be ready for God's people? Do I come in the right mental and emotional frame? Okay? Uh, practical piece of advice. Husbands and wives and with your children. Sunday morning on the way here is not the time to start an argument. It's really not. There's better times to handle things for us to try and work together because we gather together like this once a week. And the Spirit comes and meets with us. And if we understand that, it is a priority. It orients. It directs my day. Monday morning when I get up and go run, I listen to all kinds of different music. Sunday morning, it is only worship music because the entire time I'm getting my heart ready to come and gather with God's people. Am I doing that? If I am, then I have a chance of saying, yes, I'm expecting God to meet with me. If I'm not, if I stayed up late goofing off Saturday night, got up late Sunday morning, got here late, picked a fight with my wife on the way here, and then say, I didn't really sense God's spirit this morning. You think? That's a shocker. The, the whole time I was not being prepared. Do I come with expectation and faith that God's Spirit will fill our midst as we gather? Do I have an active expectation that God is going to meet with us? We're not going through a religious ritual. We're not just singing a few songs. God is going to meet. He's going to reveal himself to me. I'm going to know him better as a result of what his Spirit does. Do I have that expectation? There's a, a theological phrase, and it's not important that you remember this, but it's one of the things that the church developed an argument over. And it was, does God work ex opere operato? That's a Latin phrase, and it means if you just do the right thing, is everything okay? And the answer to that question is no. 
God works when we respond in faith. If you don't respond in faith, you don't receive anything from God. So you can be sitting in the midst of a gathering where God is working powerfully all around you and you're getting nothing out of it. Or I'm getting nothing out of it. But that's not because God's not working. That's because I'm not coming with an expectant faith to reach out and grab. I, I say this regularly. When we speak the benediction at the end of the meeting, not just a set of words. It's not just some Bible verses I'm going to read this morning. God has promised to bless you. And the only thing that stands between you and that blessing is reaching out and grabbing it by faith. That's what determines it. Not whether I do a great job of it or whatever. Do we believe, do we expectantly respond in faith? And that will lead us to coming to the table this morning. Because one of two things can happen here in a moment. You can have some bread and juice. Or you can be met by the Spirit of God, and you can eat and drink the grace of God. And you can be united with your Lord Jesus Christ in all of his saving benefits. And the difference is not whether I say the words rightly or do the exact right formula. The difference is am I responding in faith? Am I hearing and receiving from what the Holy Spirit is going to do. Because I promise you, God has promised He will meet you. It's not up to me. It's not up to what else we've done this morning. He has promised He will meet you. He might meet you if you were out hiking in the woods right now. He might. But He has guaranteed He will meet you at His table. The, so if I don't meet Him at the table... It's because I'm not coming expectant. I'm just going through the motions. So I want to urge you, as we celebrate this sacrament this morning, not just a ritual, but the actual experience of God by the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage and urge you to exercise faith, to receive the blessings of God's presence as we come to the table together. So what we're going to do, I encourage, go ahead and get out your communion packet. I will remind, and especially for our visitors, if you've never used one of these little packets, there's two parts. You're going to be pulling the first part back just for the bread in, the, in a couple moments. And then there's going to be a, the second part where you will pull back to get the cup. So let me go ahead and pray, and then we will come to the Lord's table. Holy Spirit of the living God, we invite your presence here at this sacrament. Meet us so that these simple symbols of bread and the cup may unite us with Jesus and with all of his saving benefits. For we ask this in his name. Amen. For what I receive from the Lord, I pass on to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out so that all of your sins may be forgiven. Drink from this, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, when you took flesh, and tabernacled among us. You were the true temple of God. You yourself declared that if those who rejected you destroyed the temple of your body, you would raise it in three days. And under God's sovereignty, they did break your body and crucify you, attempting to destroy the very temple of God. But it was not they alone who did this for it was our sin 
that required the cross. It was our sin that nailed your hands and feet. It was our sin that held you there until all was accomplished and you died. But thanks be to God. As you promised, your body was raised in three days, overwhelming sin and conquering death. In taking this bread today, we confess our own sin and we profess that our only hope of pardon is found in you. But this is a sure hope, for you have conquered sin in the grave and give forgiveness and life to us. Thanks be to God for the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, take and eat. Lord, on the night you were betrayed, you declared that your blood is the blood of the new covenant. In spilling your blood, you have done everything to pay the penalty for our sin and to open the path for our restoration to the Father. But you have called us to respond in faith. And as your own brother James wrote, it is not enough to say we believe. Even the demons know that you are Lord. We are called to a true faith a faith that knows the truth and actively embraces you. In taking this cup, we acknowledge that you died so that we might be forgiven and live. And we agree that this testimony is true and we actively embrace you and your provision by faith. Thanks be to God for the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, take and drink. Friends, let's stand together for a closing prayer and word of benediction. And I encourage you, as I pray, you know, you don't know the exact same words, I encourage you, please pray along with me. Please join in and let us ask the Holy Spirit to meet us as he has promised. Holy Spirit, we are ever dependent upon you. Apart from your work, our songs would be but empty tunes, our prayers only religious sounding words, and our teachings just words spoken by men. But you are powerful to work through these means of grace, drawing us into true spiritual worship interceding and guiding our prayers even when we don't know what or how to pray, and anointing the preached word so that it becomes the very words of life. So too, you have worked in this simple sacrament so that we have feasted upon the grace of God and been united with our risen Lord. Come fill us now, fall fresh in Pentecostal power, inflame our desire for God, and extinguish our taste for sin. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would blow into this temple now, imparting and stirring up your gifts, revealing your truth, cultivating your fruit. Lord, I ask that you would fill us individually so that we might honor you in our bodies each day this week. And Lord, I pray now that as we gather together one week from now, you will fill the church so that we may freshly experience the great grace of our God. Lord, we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ and God's people, his priest and his temple say, amen. Amen. I encourage you now by faith to receive God's blessing. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus so that with one heart and one mouth, 
you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, go forth full of the Spirit, blessed, and be a blessing. Amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.